Keep the Faith Ministry. Keep the Faith brings you timely messages with in-depth spiritual analysis of current events in light of Bible prophecy so you can prepare for the coming of Jesus. Listen to what the news won't tell you. Here is another important message for our times. This is Pastor Hal Mayer. Welcome to Keep the Faith Ministry once again. Today we're going to have a look at the impact of the ecumenical movement on the world. It has opened the secret doors of opportunity for a certain global organization that is seeking to rule the world and bring God's people to their end. But let me first say how much I appreciate your support for our mission. We only rely on your prayers and gifts. That is the only way we can provide you with spiritual messages that bless your soul. So many thanks for your support. Don't forget to order your copy of the DVD series Religious Liberty in the Age of Trump, which Pastor Stephen Bohr, Pastor Steve Wolberg, Pastor Gary Jensen, and I did at Secrets Unsealed. There are three presentations and then a very insightful two-hour roundtable discussion. It's only seventeen ninety-five plus postage. Also, our new DVD series is out called Firebell in the Night. It will help you see how close we are to the precipice in terms of losing our religious liberties. This series has been released just at the very time when some within the church are saying the end-time scenario described in the book of Revelation and the book Great Controversy aren't going to happen. They are taking aim at the last generation doctrines, including the three angels' messages, and it is coming from very well-placed and high-level sources in the seminaries and from other places where liberalism and disloyalty is being used to destroy our message. And it is happening at the very time when God's last generation of faithful followers of Jesus need to be giving the last message. The enemy is shrewd. He is pulling out all the stops and is trying to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Firebell in the Night shows you that we are on the edge of the very things these influential men and women try to deny. Call our office in Virginia at 540-672-3553 or call our office in Victoria 03-5963-7011. This 10-part series is only $44.95 USD plus postage. And don't forget to share your pink card with a friend and invite them to join our subscription list. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we see the signs of the times unfolding around us and we realize that we need your guidance, your grace, and your power in our lives to prepare for the coming events. We realize that we are in the last days and that we are the last generation with a unique message and a unique mission. As dangers arise, may our courage and strength be renewed, and may you take the fear away by your presence. I pray that I will be faithful to your message. I pray that all those within the sound of my voice will also be faithful. And as we study the ecumenical movement today, I pray you will speak to us through your Holy Spirit. Teach us what we need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation 13, verse 3. It reads like this, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. I would like you to think about the healing of the deadly wound for a minute. The wound was inflicted to knock back the papacy from its position of persecuting power and political prestige by Napoleon's General Berthier. But the Bible tells us that it won't be that way forever. In the end of time, the deadly wound will be healed. This has been happening gradually for many decades now, particularly since the end of Vatican II in 1965. The Second Vatican Council began the process of reconciliation with the separated churches from her communion. It has been a long and slow and arduous task involving several popes in the intervening years from Pope Paul VI, who oversaw the conclusion of the council, John Paul I, the 33-day pope, and John Paul II, who reigned for 26 years. Benedict XVI and now Pope Francis followed them. Anglicans and Episcopalians, 
Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, and other mainstream churches have long been involved with the ecumenical movement and have been getting closer and closer back to Rome. Under Pope Francis, he has drawn in the Waldenses, the Pentecostals, and the Evangelicals. He's even started to draw in the last remaining global church that has a message to come out of Babylon and join Christ's remnant people. The ecumenical movement has been around a long time now. The underlying purpose of the ecumenical movement is to reach out to the other non-Catholic churches and reduce or eliminate their objections to Rome's teachings and practices. But there's something more important to the Vatican's end game that we need to understand. One of the key purposes of the ecumenical movement is hidden from most people. Rome sees it, but most Protestants do not. Let me also point out that the Jesuits were established to undo all that Protestantism has done. And since the ecumenical movement has targeted the Protestants, among others, it is no surprise if they're involved as well. Listen to this important statement. It's from Great Controversy, page 234. Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason, and conscience wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power." There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of papal supremacy. But it wasn't just the Jesuits. Rome had come up with some well-thought-out ways of undermining the Protestants without them even knowing it. And right up until the 1960s, the Second Vatican Council, there were hostilities and polemics between Roman Catholics and Protestants on an ongoing basis. Rome also had to think about how to bring the whole world back into her bosom and seek for global political power and heal that deadly wound. Listen to this. One of the key elements of that was the introduction of liberalism into the Protestant churches. Liberalism moved them away from their biblical moorings. This left them vulnerable to the approach of Rome because it removed their moral barriers. All manner of conflicts arose within them. They no longer had a focal point by which to unite them, and now Rome's ecumenical approach seemed too good to them. Another key element in getting the churches to join the ecumenical movement including joining them to Rome by helping them with social projects that were and are important to them, including everything from soup kitchens, abortion protests, and now even the defense of religious liberty. In fact, Rome has taken the religious liberty issue away from Seventh-day Adventists, especially as SDAs have diminished their role and engagement in religious liberty. And there are many other ways in which the Protestant churches have lost their footing. It was not just one thing. It has been many things. Great Controversy, page 565, says, But Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than at any former period in her history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Most people have no idea what the real purposes of Rome are. They do not see that while Rome has engaged them in the ecumenical movement, that they have opened the door, the secret door, for Rome to regain supremacy political supremacy that she had in the old world. They do not realize that by letting Rome have more political opportunities and by her engagement with government leaders as well, they have given Rome the tools she needed to become the world ruler. It is hard for them to see because they do not really believe the Bible. 
If they did, they would see that Rome has been predicted to become the world puppet master. They now think it is okay for Catholics to be in national leadership or even global leadership. They think it's better if a politician has Jesuit training. They think that somehow there is no danger from Rome, and the reason is because of the ecumenical movement. The reason for Rome's ascendancy and her increasing power and the muted voice of Protestants is because of the ecumenical movement. And this is what the Bible predicts when it says the deadly wound would be healed. Consider this important statement from the book Great Controversy. It's page 445. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce her decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed the image of the Roman hierarchy, and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. So the ecumenical movement began by engaging the Protestants in social projects and in culture wars to solve social and political dilemmas that were common to both Roman Catholics and Protestants alike such as abortion and religious liberty in the marketplace, especially in light of the LGBTQ plus equality issue. With a little thought, it can be clearly seen that the ecumenical movement was the means of reducing objections to Rome. After all, how can you object to Rome when you are working together in the trenches? How could they object to Rome's involvement in American politics when the culture wars were strongly political? Rome began to be seen by Protestants as a very important ally in dealing with the increasingly secular America. Rome cannot raise her voice against the LGBTQ plus movement because so many of her priests and bishops are homosexuals themselves, as well as pedophiles. But in the areas of abortion or the pro-life movement and now religious liberty, she can have a voice. Gradually, Protestants were led to think that the Roman Catholic Church had changed and that now it had no hostile agenda toward them. Rome was friendly with them all, and they fell for it. In fact, since most Protestants keep Sunday, they are fundamentally in sympathy with Rome. Soon, Rome began to invite them to discuss doctrine with her, and justification by faith became the burning issue among those in dialogue with Rome— Rome tampered with the wording of her catechism to adjust it in such a way so that Protestants would accept it. Rome hasn't changed her core doctrines of penance, pilgrimage, mariology, indulgences, or even salvation. They have just cosmetically changed the wording. Now Protestants are enthusiastic about collaboration with Rome. They are enthusiastic about progress on doctrinal discussions, but they are willing to believe more than what Rome has actually done with her adjustments. They do not see that Rome is like a chameleon. But did you notice that part about doctrines which are held by them in common? That's where the ecumenical movement starts. They focus on that in which they agree, and it draws them in. We'll say more about that later. Great Controversy, page 571, says the papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of latter times. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as a part of the Church of Christ? But that is actually what is happening. And now Protestants view Rome in, with much favor. And if you object to it, you are accused of being a bigot. Listen to this statement, Great Controversy 563. Romanism is now regarded by Protestants with far greater favor than in former years. In those countries where Catholicism is not in the ascendancy and the papists are taking a conciliatory course in order to gain influence. This statement is very insightful and points out clearly where Rome is headed. Think about this. This was written long before the ecumenical movement was officially sanctioned by Rome. The point is that Rome has been at this much longer than Vatican II. I'll read on. There is an increasing indifference concerning the doctrines that separate the Reformed churches from the papal hierarchy. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, we do not differ so widely upon vital points as has been supposed, and that a little concession on our part will bring us into a better understanding with Rome. 
So who's doing the concessions? It is the Protestants, not the Catholics, at least not in fundamental understanding of salvation. And it's over doctrine. Protestants are ready to yield their doctrinal principles in order to have fellowship with Catholics. This will lead to the loss of liberty, not for those who are going along with Rome's Sunday laws, but for those who maintain the Bible Sabbath. Protestants do not see that in order to maintain liberty, they need to defend even the smallest group of people whose liberties are in the minority. Reading on from Great Controversy 563. The time was when Protestants placed high value upon the liberty of conscience which had been so clearly purchased. They taught their children to abhor popery and held that to seek harmony with Rome would be disloyalty to God. But how widely different are the sentiments now expressed? You see, now they work together. Now they collaborate on all manner of social projects, but they have been even cooperating on church services, rituals like Lent and other Catholic rituals, as well as on the social projects. Friends, here is a Bible verse that should reveal what is happening in our time. Rome is truly the leader in apostasy of the latter days. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It is the Protestants that are falling away from their principles. Rome had fallen away virtually from God from the very beginning. What Martin Luther had done, what John Calvin had done, and what the Methodists had done is now being swept away by the new fanaticism to meet and fellowship with Rome. These men would oppose this movement with every sinew of their bodies. But think about it. It is very flattering to a megachurch leader like Rick Warren to be invited to the Vatican to present a paper on family life. It is flattering for someone like Kenneth Copeland to be invited by the Pope to travel with his wife Gloria to Rome along with a few other Pentecostals and be invited to have a three and a half hour meeting with Pope Francis. No one gets that much time with the Pope. No one outside the Roman hierarchy has lunch with the Pope at the Vatican. The ecumenical movement has played on the insecurity of the Protestant churches about teaching Bible truth about the Catholic Church so they no longer preach it. It has changed the dynamic among the Protestant churches, and now they all want to be involved in the ecumenical movement and become friends with Rome. The ecumenical movement even softens the impact of the global sex scandal. Evangelicals are not so concerned about it. They have their own reasons, which would include that they need help from Rome with their culture wars. It is the secularists that have been exposing Rome's corruption, it is an effort on the part of the liberals to expose and discredit the Pope, the papacy, and the hierarchy. Why? So that Rome will be weak in its effort to oppose their lifestyles. They do not want Rome's religious voice to be heard in the war over abortion and religious liberty, among other things. They don't want Rome's voice to be heard when it angles and presses for a Sunday law. After all, how can Rome press for a Sunday law when she has these shameful scandals swirling around her? So Rome has to clean up her act. She has to make amends where she can. She has to apologize for her sins and corruptions. And this she is doing, and it has an ecumenical impact. Protestants can say, well, Rome is humble. She apologizes for that. We don't need to discuss this with her. This situation will also make it difficult for those who give the three angels messages to expose Rome because Protestants will make excuses for her. So the ecumenical movement is anything but worthy. It is a part of the end-time apostasy that is healing the deadly wound. Paul is saying that the coming of Christ would not come in his day because there must come a great apostasy first. What greater apostasy could there be than for a global church that claims to follow Christ or act in the name of Christ to actually be worshiping Satan and try to force people to worship Satan. But that is exactly what Paul is speaking about. The man of sin is an apostate ruler who presides over religious people, but who is really a representative of Satan. You see, Satan has to be given the opportunity to manifest himself. 
on a grand scale in order for the issues in the great controversy between Christ and Satan to be matured and resolved. He has to be permitted to demonstrate his principles of sin. And one way he does this is through pretending to be Christ and by getting deceived people to follow him as if he were Christ. The Apostle John in his Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 and 4 also says that when Rome's deadly wound is healed, the world will worship the dragon and the beast. The apostasy includes many things. It involves moral apostasy, it involves doctrinal apostasy, it involves seeking the aid of a civil government to enforce its dogmas on the people. This is the work of the man of sin. The man of sin turns true worship on its head, so that instead of worshiping Christ, the people actually worship Satan. It involves a spiritual control system known as spiritual formation. It involves the destruction of the home and family. It involves disgusting moral crimes. It involves spiritualism in which the dead are considered to be alive and are in heaven, and that they communicate with us or intercede for us with Christ. These things are condemned by Scripture as of Satan. This apostasy represents a system of teaching and worship which involves deceptive satanic influences like fear to keep the people from having a true understanding of God and of salvation. This is not just a bit of backsliding on an individual scale. It's not only a personal sin, but also a corporate sin that involves many nations or churches among the nations. It is a massive system of deception that necessarily involves the geopolitical world too. It involves money, finance, global politics, as well as lifeless rituals and ceremonies. It involves the veneer of beautiful churches and massive cathedrals, candles, penance, pilgrimages, indulgences for sin, and loads of other worthless rubbish that is designed to keep the people under spiritual control. When a church cannot rely on the power of God, it must resort to earthly power. So this apostate church appeals to the state or nations of the world to help her resurrect her power and might. She appeals to the kings and rulers to assist her in restoring her ancient control over society. And this is happening very effectively, right before our eyes. In fact, Protestants, or evangelicals, as they now like to be called, won't protest because Rome helps them with things that are important to them in the culture wars. Now, I would like you to think about where we are in the stream of time in light of the ecumenical movement. The world has passed several tipping points that are irreversible. All of these are required as part of the end-time principles that will unfold in our day. In fact, they are unfolding right now. What is a tipping point? A tipping point is the point at which an issue crosses a certain threshold and gains significant momentum. It is often triggered by some minor event or development that pushes it forward rapidly. And once the tipping point is reached, there is no turning back. It is irreversible. There may still be delays and complications in reaching the issue's ultimate goals, which slow the progress down, but the progress continues. Keep in mind that before a tipping point on any given issue is reached, those that are working to achieve its goals are silent. They work quietly and stealthily until they see that the tipping point has been reached, and then they are right out in the open with it because they know that nothing can stop them achieving their goals sooner or later. I have watched the signs of the times for many years. I sense that we have reached several tipping points all at once, right now in our lifetime. I have always looked to the future for these things to be fulfilled, and I wondered how the predictions of the Bible would unfold in practical ways. But now I see that quietly, stealthily, surreptitiously, the political and economic things of this earth are being aligned with the power of Satan and that he is constructing the very elements needed for the end-time prophecies to be fulfilled in every detail. I see now that it is not the future. The foundation has already been laid. The walls have been built, and now the roof is being put over the top of the building, the superstructure that will one day be used to oppress God's people. We are nearing the completion of the full complement of devices that are required in order for Satan to rule the world through his church on earth. It must be that those angels holding back the four winds of strife on the earth are permitting rather rapid progress at the moment. They must understand that probationary time on the earth is limited and that matters must develop so that all can see the purposes of Satan and his cohorts and make an informed choice. They see that there are a few precious souls 
that are being sealed by overcoming all their sins in Christ. I think it's worthy for us to note the tipping points that have reached the point of no return, so that we can understand the role of the ecumenical movement. First, there is the tipping point of globalization. It's no longer a conspiracy theory. It's now right out in the open. Every day, every week, the news is full of globalization or its consequences. They don't like Mr. Trump because he is working against globalization principles. But that will only last for so long. In fact, what Mr. Trump achieves will be used by the globalists in their agenda down the track. They don't hide it. Without globalization, you cannot have a universal Sunday law. Without a global system of government, without a global economic system, without a global enforcement mechanism, it can't happen. Well, now it has happened, and Rome is right in the middle of globalization. Globalization leads to centralization of power politically and economically, educationally, as well as other means. This consolidation and centralization involves wealth redistribution. It involves digitization of currency. It involves massive surveillance and climate change prevention. It's all there. The second tipping point is the Jesuit influence on the leadership of the world. It is phenomenal. The Jesuits train many, if not most, of the political leaders, judges, business leaders, and many others, generation by generation. They mentor them, and then they work with them while they are in office. Even Donald Trump had some training at a Jesuit school in New York. Currently, Mr. Trump's choices for federal judges are being guided by Leonard Leo, a lawyer and a dedicated Roman Catholic who has dedicated many years of his life to building a nationwide infrastructure of lawyers, judges, and business leaders who seek to foster the application of our nation's founding principles, advancing limited constitutional government. He is picking Mr. Trump's judges both for the Supreme Court and for the federal bench. Many of these judges are Roman Catholic, and some of them have been trained in Jesuit schools. Therefore, Leo's efforts will eventually undermine the religious freedoms enshrined in the U.S. Constitution and undermine the very principles it claims to defend and uphold. There's a point here that should be made. Rome has learned how to co-opt even limited government and religious freedom in developing her power. Listen to this statement from Great Controversy, page 566. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They've made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. I believe we reached a tipping point concerning the Jesuit ascent to political prominence. And with the very popular Jesuit in the papal office, it is inevitable that Jesuit training will bring more such individuals into political prominence as well. The Jesuits are no longer hiding their activity, or at least most of it. They are no longer afraid to be seen out in the open politically, economically, and in every other way. A third tipping point is the dramatic momentum that the homosexual rights movement has achieved. Same-sex marriage has gripped the center stage of social change, and it is happening everywhere in Western societies as well as some other large nations. Homosexual rights have marched right into prominence after years of investment and strategic planning on the part of activists. All their planning, scheming, and organizing has finally come to fruition. One law after another that defended traditional marriage has collapsed in nations around the globe. The courts accepted reformulated definitions of lifestyle and marriage and have struck down laws that stand in the way of the gay agenda. The days of Lot have come upon us. The men of the city are surrounding the legal house of Western nations. They would tear it down if permitted to do so, and they may be permitted, because Jesus himself said, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, Luke 17, verse 28 and 30. Another tipping point is the destruction of Western constitutions, especially that of the United States. Prior to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, the U.S. Constitution still had some substance in it. Now it is but a shell. Since then, it has increasingly been stripped of its significance. Judges, legislators, presidents do what they want, regardless of the Constitution. And now there is a backlash. Mr. Trump epitomizes that backlash, and with a Republican Senate, he's trying to do something about it. 
at least at the court level. He and his evangelical advisors know that they cannot achieve a limited constitutional government through a political revolution. It is too vulnerable to political swings from one side to the other. Mr. Trump inherited an unprecedented opportunity to seat many new judges on the federal bench because of the Republican refusal to appoint Obama nominees during Mr. Obama's last two years in office. And he is using it to change the way America thinks about its constitution through the federal courts. And this will have a long-term effect. These judges are being vetted by Leonard Leo, a conservative Roman Catholic who, as I mentioned before, is scouring the country for judges that hold strong constitutionalist views. They're trying to appoint judges that won't gradually swing left. So Mr. Trump has set out to change America's judiciary and appoint ideologically conservative judges that will swing the nation back to its conservative underpinnings and force the legislature to enact laws that will support conservative culture. How this will happen and how long it will take is unclear, but they are appointing the judges and getting them in place. When a lower court hands down a ruling in favor of abortion, for instance, once the federal courts are stacked with conservative judges, that ruling can easily be struck down. That would mean that the lower liberal court would have to be much more careful in the way they address their cases if they want them upheld at a higher court. But there is one other movement that has reached a tipping point. With the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, the ecumenical movement has destroyed almost all of what is left of Protestantism. Protestantism was first neutered and now is being completely overthrown. And again, the churches, especially evangelical churches, are vulnerable to it because they have not followed the Bible, even though they think they are Bible churches. And by the fact that most churches keep Sunday, which is a Roman Catholic institution, they show that they are vulnerable to Rome's deceptive arguments. And are they ever vulnerable? Rome's ultimate goal is full, visible, sacramental unity with other churches. Whether she will achieve that before the end of time remains to be seen. However, Rome now has the respect of the evangelical and mainstream churches. She has the respect of the Orthodox churches, the Protestant churches, and she even has the respect of many in the SDA church. The pathway to achieve that level of unity involves many discussions and agreements with Protestant and evangelical churches. It involves much patient dialogue and discussion. It involves acceptance of baptisms on both sides, acceptance of each other's liturgy, and ultimately the acceptance of each other's communion table. It involves the exchange of pulpits between Catholics and other churches. It involves collaboration in political matters, social matters, and religious matters. It involves the World Council of Churches. It involves peace initiatives, climate change initiatives, and collaboration on other core beliefs that are common to all or most of them. Keep in mind that the one common belief to virtually all of them is Sunday worship. So when they have come together in all the other important areas, they will then come together on Sunday worship, and it will become very political, not just religious. For instance, President Trump has brought many evangelicals into close consultation with him concerning political and social matters. He's given them a lot of power and influence. He now sounds like an evangelical quite often. What has happened to the Roman Catholics that were swarming all over the Bush administration? Roman Catholics are still involved, but not as openly right now. They have pulled back in order to let the evangelicals do their work because they know that Americans relate better to evangelical leaders than to papal leaders. Evangelicals are working to shape White House policies. This is giving them political experience. Make no mistake about it, the bishops are guiding them behind the scenes. They are being advised which political battles to take up and which battles to avoid. The bishops also know that a big change has happened to the evangelicals that makes them much more suitable for political engagement. Back in the 1980s, when the moral majority got going, it was short-lived, really. It didn't last all that long. The reason for that was because evangelicals were not in unity. They had so many doctrinal differences that they could not find common ground to work together. Now, however, they have learned something from the Roman Catholic ecumenical movement that is very important to them. 
They have learned how to lay aside their doctrinal differences so that they can work together to achieve certain goals that they all have in common. This is a very powerful practical outcome of the ecumenical movement. Now, not only do Catholics and evangelicals work together, but evangelicals now work together with each other, thanks to Rome's ecumenical movement. The ecumenical movement leads to the depreciation of things distinctive and leaves nothing but ceremony. Bible authority is replaced with human authority, particularly that of the Pope. It will become increasingly difficult to give God's last warning message to a lost and fallen world. There is one more thing that we need to think about. The enemy has targeted God's church. The ecumenical movement has many goals, but deep down underneath them all is that the ecumenical movement is aimed ultimately at the three angels' messages and those that uphold them. Rome would know this. The enemy would know this. And in fact, the enemy has created the ecumenical movement to bring the whole world on side against the very few faithful Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping people who are the remnant of Bible prophecy. He is making war with them. It is a subtle war, it, and as the ecumenical movement influences the whole world, many of God's people are likely to find themselves involved, inextricably drawn, into the bosom of Rome. Friends, this is not the time to compromise with Rome. It is the time to stand against her teachings. Those who do will be honored of God. But God's remnant church is being drug into it, Many ecumenical events have become a part of the mainstream activities of re the Religious Liberty Department of the General Conference, and no doubt other levels as well. Friends, this is not going to end well. We are up against the enemy who has far more resources than we do. He has far more influence and power than we do, and he is changing the social dynamics so that we will be drawn in and cannot escape the snare described in the book The Great Controversy. This is from Great Controversy 581. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence on legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She's piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur a reproach and persecution. Friends, the Bible instructs us to come out, not get closer to Rome. Revelation 18.4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18, verse 4. And here's one more verse that emphasizes this point. When God says to go in, he does not mean that we can decide for ourselves what we want to do. But when God says come out, he knows that if we do not, we will be drawn into a web of deception that will lead to our eternal ruin. This is from Isaiah 48, verse 20. Go ye forth of Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth, say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. Your redemption depends on your obedience to God, my friends. This is not salvation by works. It is avoidance of the destruction that will waste Rome and all who are linked to her. You may think that things will go on just as they always have. You may think, like in the days of Noah, that there will be no change. But listen to this persistent voice calling you to repentance. Before we close, I want to say that the tipping points we discussed earlier are leading in one direction. It is toward the judgments of God. Not one of them is in harmony with heaven. All of them are begging for divine retribution, and the cities are in the middle of it all. If you live in a city, it is time to find how to get out. This is from Last Day Events, page 115. I am bidden to declare the message that cities full of transgression and sinful in the extreme 
will be destroyed by earthquakes, by fire, by flood. And this one from page 117 of the same book. Strictly will the cities of the nations be dealt with, and yet they will not be visited in the extreme of God's indignation, because some souls will yet break away from the delusions of the enemy, and will repent and be converted. You may think that the cities have already been strictly dealt with, but let me just throw out two more statements to help you see that we have not yet seen the fullness of this. This is from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 356. There will soon be a sudden change in God's dealings. The world in its perversity is being visited by casualties, by floods, storms, fires, earthquakes, famines, wars, and bloodshed. Oh, that men might understand the patience and long-suffering of God. He is putting under restraint his own attributes. His omnipotent power is under the control of omnipotence. Oh, that men would understand that God refuses to be wearied out with the world's perversity and still holds out the hope of forgiveness even to the most undeserving. But his forbearance will not always continue. Who is prepared for the sudden change that will take place in God's dealing with sinful men? Who will be prepared to escape the punishment that will certainly fall upon transgressors? Think about this astounding statement for a minute. The world is already being visited by floods, storms, fires, earthquakes, famines, wars, and bloodshed. So those things, at least at the current level, are not the meaning of this sudden change. The visitations that we see now are only just warnings. They are a small token of what to expect when God suddenly changes his dealings with perverse humanity. Couple that statement with this from Last Day Events, page 111. The end is near, and every city is to be turned upside down every way. There will be confusion in every city. Everything that can be shaken is to be shaken, and we do not know what will come next. The judgments will be according to the wickedness of the people and the light of truth that they have had. Did you hear that about every city being turned upside down? That's a lot of cities and a lot of people that will be affected. Oh, that God's people had a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities, now almost given to idolatry. Thousands of cities? That's hundreds of millions of people. And this from Last Day Events, page 111 also. The time is near when large cities will be swept away, and all should be warned of these coming judgments. So what do cities have to do with ecumenism? Well, it is the cities where the megachurches are. It is the cities where the bishops have much more influence. It is the cities where the ecumenical movement is being cemented together. Therefore, it is the cities where the judgments of God are going to fall. My friends, we are near the end. Major developments are gradually, silently, and stealthily taking place. We have no time to lose. We must prepare now. God bless you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Please help us to understand the ecumenical movement and that it is not a friend of truth. It is not a friend of righteousness, even though it may sound pious and even godly. Help us to realize that our role is to warn God's people wherever they are that they should come out of Babylon, not get closer to her. Please send us your Holy Spirit in our lives so that we may be overcomers and that Jesus has the freedom to pour out his Holy Spirit in our lives in the latter rain power. Help us to become more versed in Scripture and be prepared for the crisis and the second coming. In Jesus' name, Amen.
We hope you've been greatly blessed by this month's message. Your prayers and gifts mean much to us. Thank you for your support. The music you have just heard is a medley of Sweet Hour of Prayer, Nearer Still Nearer, and Nearer My God to Thee, played by Raphael Scarfullery on the classical guitar. It's called Sweet Hour of Prayer. If you would like to have a copy of the CD, just send $16 postpaid to U.S. addresses to cover the cost, and we will send you one. Please mention the Sweet Hour of Prayer CD. Our Australian listeners can order through our Victoria office at 03-5963-7011. Other international listeners should send $20 USD. Following is our monthly prophetic intelligence briefing, a feature that brings you current events in light of prophecy, especially for those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. We can see the signs of the times telling us that we are nearing the world's great crisis. May the Lord find us faithful. Our first item this month, Warsaw Conference on Iran Sounds Like War Talk. The U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has sharply rebuked Washington's European allies over their efforts to shield their businesses from U.S. sanctions on Iran as transatlantic tensions over U.S. foreign policy were laid bare at a conference in Warsaw. A scheme the EU has set up to facilitate trade with Iran was an effort to break American sanctions against Iran's murderous revolutionary regime, Pence said, during a conference in the Middle East organized by the U.S. in the Polish capital. It is an ill-advised step that will only strengthen Iran, weaken the EU, and create still more distance between Europe and the United States, he said. The Warsaw meeting was attended by more than 60 nations, but major European powers such as Germany and France, parties to the landmark 2015 nuclear accord with Iran, refused to send their top diplomats over fears that the summit was designed largely to build an alliance against Tehran. The U.S., by contrast, is represented by Pence, Mike Pompeo, Washington's top diplomat, and Jared Kushner, Donald Trump's son-in-law, a special aide to the Middle East. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is also attending. The Obama administration eased U.S. sanctions on Iran under the terms of the nuclear deal, but Trump reimposed them when he withdrew the U.S. from the agreement last year. You can't achieve stability in the Middle East without confronting Iran. It's just not possible, Pompeo told reporters after his formal opening statement. 
There are malign influences in Lebanon, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq, he said, referring to the groups Iran supports. The three H's, the Houthis, Hamas, and Hezbollah, these are real threats, Netanyahu described at the opening dinner at which he sat alongside senior officials from Arab Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, as a historical turning point. Many Arab states do not recognize Israel and have not shared a diplomatic stage with the country since a Middle East peace conference in Madrid in 1991, but they've been driven together by their common fear of Iran. It remains to be seen how far the new alliance can extend to a combined approach to the Palestinian issue. It is expected Kushner will discuss his peace plan with Arab leaders in private as well as at a public session on the sidelines of the summit. Netanyahu has argued that the Arab world is open to normalized economic ties with Israel that are not dependent on the resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Palestinian officials have condemned the summit. Netanyahu, who faces elections shortly, told reporters in Warsaw, in a room of some 60 foreign ministers representative of dozens of governments, an Israeli prime minister and the foreign ministers of the leading Arab countries stood together and spoke with unusual force, clarity, and unity against the common threat of the Iranian regime. I think this marks a change and important understanding of what threatens our future, what we need to do to secure it, and the possibility that cooperation will extend beyond security in every realm of life. Officials said Netanyahu spoke around the same table as senior officials of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, none of which have relations with Israel. The country only has diplomatic relations with two Arab states, neighboring Egypt and Jordan. Pompeo's call in his opening speech for a new era of cooperation in the Middle East will be viewed with skepticism by EU leaders who feel they were not consulted on the U.S. decision to pull out of the Iran deal or plan the withdrawal of 2,000 U.S. troops from Syria. The Iranian Foreign Minister Yaved Zarif described the Warsaw Conference as dead on arrival and another attempt by the U.S. to pursue an unfounded obsession with Iran. The Warsaw Conference came as the Russian President Vladimir Putin, increasingly seen as a key player in the Middle East, hosted his Iranian and Turkish counterparts to discuss the final settlement in the Syrian civil war, including the presence of a large number of Islamist fighters in Idlib province. The three countries, particularly Turkey and Iran, do not agree on the final settlement in Syria, but have been uneasily cooperating to find a solution that does not betray their interests. The signs of the times tell us we are surely in the last days. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We can see these perils more distinctly here in Europe. Things are rapidly developing. All are ranging under their respective banners. All are preparing for some great event. All are watching for the morning. One class is watching and waiting for their Lord, while the other class is waiting for what Lucifer may perform of his wonder-working power. Kingdoms are in uncertainty, one watching jealously the other. Soldiers are being drilled constantly, preparing for war. There is a rending apart of kingdoms. The stone cut out of the mountains without hands is surely to smite the image upon its feet. The king of Prussia, I think it is, dare not go out of his domain unless the whole passage of his journey is barricaded with soldiers. He seems to be a prisoner in one sense in his own kingdom. Other kingdoms are in jeopardy. They dare not travel for fear of their lives unless in the very heart of a bodyguard of armed soldiers. That's letter 102, 1886. Next, Australian doctor investigated for refusing sex-based abortion. A Catholic doctor in Australia could face suspension or loss of his license for refusing to refer a couple who sought the sex-based abortion of their unborn daughter. I refused to refer the patient because there was no medical reason to do it and it offended my moral conscience, Dr. Mark Hobart told Nine News Australia. It's very wrong. I don't know any doctor in Victoria that would be willing to refer a woman that wanted to have an abortion just because of gender at 19 weeks. The 55-year-old doctor who lives in the Australian state of Victoria has practiced medicine for 27 years. He said the pregnancy was well advanced. The married couple had asked Hobart to refer them to an abortion clinic 19 weeks into the woman's pregnancy when they discovered they were having a girl but wanted a boy.
For the last five months, Hobart has faced an investigation from the Medical Board of Australia and the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency. Victoria's Abortion Law Reform Act of 2008 requires that doctors with moral objections to an abortion refer their patient to another non-objecting practitioner for treatment and advice. He said the investigation shows that the state's abortion law stops doctors from using their conscience whether it is appropriate or not. Hobart went public about the request for sex selection abortion in April. The Medical Board of Victoria began an investigation after board members complained that the incident called into question his professional conduct. Neither the woman nor her husband filed a complaint against him, the Daily Mail reports. Any decision could affect Hobart's ability to practice medicine throughout Australia. Sex-selective abortions are common in parts of the world, particularly in some Asian countries where there is a strong cultural preference for boys over girls. The practice has contributed to severe gender imbalances in some regions. Abortions based on sex also take place in Western countries, especially in some immigrant communities. The controversial procedures have become the focus of controversy in the United Kingdom after investigative reporters with the Daily Telegraph secretly filmed doctors at British clinics agreeing to abort unborn babies merely on the basis of their sex. Opponents of sex-selective abortions contend that the procedures violate the 1967 law, allowing abortion only in a limited range of circumstances. However, the head of public prosecutions has said that the law does not expressly prohibit these sex-targeted abortions, the Catholic Herald reports. Anthony Ozimic, a spokesman for the Society for Protection of Unborn Children, warned that British doctors could face situations similar to Hobart's if sex-selective abortion continues and if conscience protections continue to be weak. The lives of baby girls and livelihoods of good doctors are at stake, he said. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's Genesis 6, verse 5. Next, is another Supreme Court justice ready to retire? No one tells a Supreme Court justice when to retire, but there are currently two retirement dramas underway at the court, one semi-public and the other semi-private, and they both have the potential to reshape the meaning of the Constitution for decades. The public story is that of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the court's senior liberal. Late last year, she fell and broke three ribs. When she was being treated, doctors discovered that she had lung cancer, her third bout with cancer. She underwent surgery, apparently successfully, and the court released word that she would need no further treatment. But in January, she missed oral arguments for the first time in 25 years on the court. Still, the retirement drama regarding Ginsburg is straightforward. She will hang on for as long as she can, in the hopes that a Democratic president will appoint her successor after the 2020 election. The more complex drama involves Clarence Thomas who is 70 years old and the longest tenured associate justice on the court. With 53 Republicans now in the Senate and no filibusters allowed on the Supreme Court nominations, President Trump would have a free hand in choosing a dream candidate for his conservative base if Thomas were to retire this year. The summer of 2019 would seem an ideal time to add a third younger conservative to the court, along with Neil Gorsuch, who is 51, and Brett Kavanaugh, who is 54. So, many conservatives are asking, why shouldn't Thomas leave now? It seems that the president may have had the same thought. Trump has shown unusual solicitude for Justice Thomas and his wife, Ginny, a hard-right political activist. The president and the first lady had the Thomases to dinner, and then Trump welcomed Ginny and some of her movement colleagues to the White House for an hour-long discussion. Trump rarely engages in this kind of cultivation and is reasonable to speculate that he's trying to persuade the justice that his seat would be in good hands if he decided to leave. But will Thomas retire? Over the years, he has made a little secret of the fact that he doesn't enjoy the job very much. With a conservative future of the court secure, why wouldn't he call it a day after 28 years? Because according to his friends, he feels an obligation to continue doing the job for as long as he is able, regardless of the political implications of his departure. Of course, no one except Thomas knows for sure what he will do, and that leaves his decision open to speculation. There seems little doubt, however, about what would happen if either he or Ginsburg leaves in the next year or two. 
The president would likely nominate as a replacement Amy Coney Barrett, a 47-year-old judge on the Seventh Circuit. A former professor at Notre Dame Law School, Barrett was nominated to the appeals court by Trump in 2017, and she has already been considered for a Supreme Court seat, the one that went to Kavanaugh. Her politics appear even more conservative than Kavanaugh's or Gorsuch's. She has been open in her disdain for the concept of abortion rights for women. She is a devout Catholic and has, in the past, expressed a willingness to overturn precedent, which some observers think makes her even more certain than Kavanaugh and Gorsuch to vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. Barrett's personal story is ready-made to weather a Supreme Court confirmation battle. She has seven children, two of them adopted from Haiti and one with special needs. She clerked on the Supreme Court for Antonin Scalia and won accolades from her students at Notre Dame. Whatever views she has expressed in the past, she looks like a difficult nominee to defeat, particularly with a loyal Republican majority in the Senate. And as President Trump contends with a combative and energized Democratic majority in the House of Representatives, it's easy to forget the magnitude of the power that he still wields. Even during the 2016 campaign, he understood the power of judicial appointments to command the support of his political base and to establish a legacy as president. With another Supreme Court vacancy or two, Trump's record and influence on the future of the country will look even more secure. The shift of the Supreme Court to the right is making many on the left rather nervous. But note that Mr. Trump would likely nominate a Roman Catholic to replace Justice Thomas, also a Catholic, should he resign, leaving the religious composition the same. Should he also have a chance at a fourth nomination, chances are better than 50-50 that he would nominate yet another Catholic to replace Ginsburg, a Jew, since nominations are vetted by a very conservative Roman Catholic, Leonard Leo. It is the religious composition of the court that should make God's people stop and think. After all, it is the right that is likely to bring on worship laws. And a court that is stacked with Roman Catholics, especially conservative Roman Catholics, way out of proportion to the overall population, will certainly have significance in the coming conflict over worship laws. Conservative judges, both at the appellate court and at the Supreme Court, will likely uphold these laws, especially under the pressures yet to unfold. God's Word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it's too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. That's The Great Controversy, page 582. Next, after signing One World Religion Covenant, Pope Francis makes his next push. Just days after the Pope signed the most important interfaith document in history, he had the opportunity to address global political leaders by video at the World Government Summit in Dubai. During his remarks, he once again stressed the need for global unity, and he encouraged those attending to embrace sustainable development. But he also stressed that sustainable development will never succeed without solidarity. Of course, most Americans don't even know that a world government summit even exists because the mainstream media in the U.S. doesn't really talk about it. But it is actually a very big deal. And obviously the Pope feels very strongly about what they are trying to do because he took time out of his very busy schedule to record a video message for them. World leaders are currently meeting at the World Government Summit, he said, taking place in Dubai from 10 to 12 February. In his video message, Pope Francis greets those participating in the summit and recalls his own visit to the United Arab Emirates earlier this month. I encountered a modern country which is looking for the future without forgetting its roots, he said. I also saw how even in the desert the flowers spring up and grow. I returned home with the hope that many deserts in the world can bloom like this. The World Government Summit is an annual event and it attracts leaders from all over the globe who are interested in a more integrated planet. 
Here is a little blurb about the summit from Wikipedia. The World Government Summit is an annual event held in Dubai, UAE. It brings together leaders in government for a global dialogue about governmental process and policies with a focus on issues of futurism, technology, and innovation, as well as other topics. The summit acts as a knowledge exchange hub between government officials, thought leaders, policymakers, and private sector leaders, and as an analysis platform for the future trends, issues, and opportunities facing humanity. The summit hosts over 90 speakers from 150 participating countries, along with over 4,000 attendees. In general, the Pope's remarks were quite similar to what we have heard before, but I thought that two buzzwords that he used were quite noteworthy. The Holy Father emphasized that we cannot really speak of sustainable development without solidarity. He concluded his message by thanking those taking part and with the prayer that the Lord might bless their commitment for a more just and prosperous world for everyone. The phrase sustainable development has become a shorthand way of referring to the UN's sustainable development goals. It is a 17-point plan, and if you read the entire thing, you quickly realize that it encompasses just about every realm of human activity that you could possibly imagine. It is not just a plan to fight climate change. It is actually a comprehensive blueprint for global governance, and it envisions a much larger role for global institutions such as the UN in the years ahead. But in the context of speaking about sustainable development, the Pope once again used the term solidarity. This is a word that he has been using a lot lately, and when he uses it, he is referring to the need for global unity. More specifically, he almost always uses this buzzword when speaking of the need for global religious unity. Recently, the Pope and the highest Imam in Sunni Islam signed a covenant which boldly declares that Christians and Muslims worship the same God and that it is God's will that all of the various major religions in the world coexist peacefully. In the aftermath of the signing of that document, the Pope once again stressed the need for more global unity. Referencing the biblical story of Noah, the Pope suggested that in order to safeguard peace, we too need to enter together as one family into an ark which can sail the stormy seas of the world. This means acknowledging God is at the origin of the one human family. No violence can be justified in the name of religion, he said. Religious behavior, said Pope Francis, needs continually to be purified from the recurrent temptation to judge others as enemies and adversaries. The perspective of heaven, he said, embraces persons without privilege or discrimination. Without a doubt, this Pope is going to continue to push for global religious unity, and that has enormous implications. Our world is becoming a smaller place with each passing day, and many are deeply concerned about what this trend toward global oneness will ultimately bring. The Bible predicts global religious unity. The only entity that can achieve it would be the Pope and the Vatican. Those who object to the ecumenical direction will be marginalized and eventually treated as extremists. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, verse 8. Next, the Pope and Time Microsoft President Discuss AI. Pope Francis met with Microsoft President Brad Smith at the Vatican to discuss the ethical use of artificial intelligence, or AI, and how to bridge the digital divide between the rich and poor nations, Reuters reports. The Vatican's Academy for Life, a research organization that promotes the church's life ethic, announced it will jointly sponsor a prize with Microsoft for the best doctoral dissertation in 2019 on the topic of artificial intelligence at the service of human life. The winner will receive 6,000 euros, or 6,800 U.S. dollars, and an invitation to Microsoft's headquarters. Smith told the Vatican newspaper L'Osservatore Romano that strong ethical and new evolved laws were needed so that technology such as AI does not fall into the wrong hands. The Microsoft president listed ethics, AI, and people-centered tech among his top concerns for 2019 in a LinkedIn post last month. We live at a time when we must stay true to timeless values as we advance new technology. I spent the afternoon at the Vatican discussing the teachings of the Church, AI ethics, and why we must always put humanity first. 
The 81-year-old Pope Francis, who once described himself as a disaster when it comes to technology, joined Twitter in 2013, taking over the at Pontifex handle used by his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, and Instagram in 2016. He now has nearly 18 million and 6 million followers on these platforms, respectively. In January, the Pope launched a prayer app called Click to Pray. Internet and the social networks are a resource of our time, a way to stay in touch with others and to share values and projects and to express the desire to form a community, he said in that week's prayer. Once again, a major tech company visits the Pope and the Vatican, this time to address artificial intelligence. The Vatican is interested in everything tech these days. Bringing the big tech companies into collusion with the Vatican seems to be a priority. This is ominous for those who plan to use those tech platforms for the proclamation of the third angel's message. In an age when technology is as global and penetrating as it is, the Pope wants to be sure that he has a lot of influence on what is done or permitted. Technology is powerful, and technology including AI gives power over everyone that wants to use it. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Revelation 13, verse 7. Next, top Catholic cardinal admits church destroyed documents on clergy sexual abuse. In a remarkable admission, German Cardinal Reinhard Marx said Saturday that documents that could have contained proof of clergy sexual abuse in the Catholic church were destroyed or never drawn up. Files that could have documented the terrible deeds and named those responsible were destroyed or not even created, said Marx, the Archbishop of Munich and the president of the German Bishops' Conference. The stipulated procedures and processes for the prosecution offenses were deliberately not complied with, he added, but instead canceled and overridden. Such standard practices will make it clear that it is not transparency which damages the church, but rather the acts of abuse committed the lack of transparency, or the ensuing cover-up. Mark's stunning admission came on the third day of a historic Vatican summit focused on combating clergy sexual abuse. The day's theme was transparency, which Mark said could help to tackle abuse of power. A member of Pope Francis' inner circle of advisors, Marx is one of the most powerful men in the Catholic Church. Four-day summit of the 190 Catholic leaders, including 114 bishops from around the world, will conclude Sunday with an address by Pope Francis. On Thursday, at the beginning of the unprecedented summit, Francis urged the bishops to take concrete measures to combat the clergy's sexual abuse scandal. At a press conference later Saturday, Marx said that the information about destroying files came from a study commissioned by German bishops in 2014. The study was scientific and did not name the particular church leaders or dioceses in Germany that destroyed the files. The study indicates that some documents were manipulated or did not contain what they should have contained, Marx said. The fact in itself cannot be denied. Marx said he doubts the destruction of files related to clergy sexual abuse was limited to one diocese. I assume Germany is not an isolated case. The report commissioned by the German bishops also revealed that at least 3,677 cases of child sex abuse by German clergy occurred between 1946 and 2014. Were these startling admissions voluntarily extracted from the cardinal? Hardly. The pressure of the news media on the Catholic Church is enormous. It is now patently obvious that the Church covered up its systemic abuse for many decades. And if she could, she would continue to do that. The Vatican has to do something to control the damage, so Rome covers with apologies the record of her horrible cruelties. And sometimes Rome destroys the records too. Apology is a form of cover-up. The Bible declares that Rome's systemic abuse is intractable and will not change except for the surface appearance. After all, she is the mother of harlots, according to the Scripture. And the woman was arrayed in purple and in scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's Revelation 17, 4 and 5. 
Unfortunately, our time is up. Remember, there are more prophetic intelligence briefings on our website at ktfnews.com. It's been a great pleasure to spend this time with you. I hope you have been encouraged to live for Jesus, for we are near the end. Remember that God has a plan for your life and that right now you can make a new start with Jesus. Thank you for your prayers and support. And until next time, may God bless and keep you and your family in His loving and protecting care. Keep the faith.